Hey folks, I'm back with Ben from MP Antennas, the maker of the H antenna. I had a great uh, conversation with him about kind of antennas in general. And really I focused on the outdoor antennas last time because that's what I'm into, but I know a lot of you don't have that option. And so I wanted to talk to Ben and kind of share that information with you is what do you do if you've got an indoor antenna? How do you make the most of it? Are they, you know, better, worse, all the rest of it? So Ben, welcome back to the, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Happy yeah. to be here again. Fucking pumped to have you on. Okay, so let's start with the, the very first question that both of us get, because you guys are an antenna manufacturer and I write about this stuff a bunch, is is it categorically better to be outside with an antenna than inside, or have you seen sometimes indoor deployments do a little bit better than your outdoor? Um, I would say 100% of the time, anything outdoors is going to be better than anything indoors. Um, the reason we make an indoor antenna versus an outdoor antenna is because some people literally cannot get their antenna outside, whether it be a HOA or a landlord or whatever it may be, they, they, they can't get the antenna outside. So that's one of the main reasons we, we developed and came out with the indoor model. Okay. And then just for kind of frame of reference, can you give a, a, a model of the outdoor antenna, indoor antenna you can hold up and just show people? Yeah. So <clears throat> this is going to be our outdoor antenna. Um, it's not very large. It's about as big as my head. Um, the indoor antenna is significantly smaller, um, not very large at all. And looking at the inner workings of it, this is what the inside looks like of the indoor antenna. And you'll see here, this is what the outdoor antenna looks like, or the elements look like for the outdoors. Um, they are significantly different. And uh, performance wise, they are very similar. But the reason we have the indoor versus the outdoor is form factor. Uh, you don't necessarily need to or want to put a bigger antenna if you don't have to. Um, the indoor antenna we also made to be directly attached to the hotspots instead of having to have a, a jumper or a piece of coax connecting the antenna to the hotspot. Okay, so you don't need a, a piece of uh, cable to go from the hotspot to the indoor antenna can attach directly to it. I can attach directly to it. Right. And if, oh. I mean, if, you, if you'd like to use the indoor outside or vice versa, um, there's no harm in doing that either. Okay, and I thought we talked about one time you'd said that sometimes you'd seen the indoor antenna does better than the outdoor antenna, depending on the location. You'd seen that at least once. So it's like, huh, that's weird. Yes, yes. And of course, you know, there's no true explanation to it of why an indoor would be better outdoors and vice versa. Um, it, I mean, every, all I have is every deployment is different. And sometimes uh, you know, whatever is working best for you is what we would recommend to do. <laughs> right. And then on the indoor antenna, if you decide to, and I've got at least one client who's done it this way. Um, I don't recommend it, but everybody's a little bit different. He had to do it because I believe his wife didn't want to look at the outdoor antenna outside, so he wanted something smaller. So everybody's got their reasons. Um, there's some weatherproofing you have to do to the indoor antenna if you put it outside. Is that right? Yeah, so they are sealed a little bit differently. Um, you know, on the, on the indoor antenna, the top and the bottom, um, there, there could be water ingress. The outdoor antenna, the only thing, the only way water can get into this antenna is through the RF connector which it's always advised to weatherproof that with uh, rubber tape and also electrical tape. I mean, and if you have the, you know, the hotspot or antenna outside for about a year, do it about once every year um, because water will find a way to get into everything. Um, that's, that's a guarantee. Okay, and you're saying with rubber tape or electrical tape, is that right? Uh, both, you could, you could have a base of rubber tape which keeps all the moisture out and then electrical tape just protects against UV. Okay, and if you're looking for rubber tape, I, I don't think I've bought that before. I think I bought Butyl stuff. Is that something that's around any hardware store? Oh yeah, you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot or any hardware store is gonna have it in the electrical section. Okay. It's a pretty common thing to have. Easy, easy stuff. Yeah, I don't, I don't deploy these indoor antennas. So I'm gonna ask some pretty newbie questions with them. Um, okay, so if you're stuck indoors, if you're in a condo or HOA or whatever it is, uh, what is the best way to deploy this indoor antenna? for maximum coverage? Uh, get it as high as possible. Um, if you're in a two-story house or even a one-story house, if you can get in the rafters, um, just get any elevation you can and also get it near something transparent like a window. Um, will it work if it's behind a wall if there is no window? It will, it's just, um, just going to vary on its performance. Okay, so the classic question is, do I put it next to my you know, one-story house? Do I put it next to my living room, my big living room window, or do I put it up in the attic where there's no windows? I mean, it, there's only one answer. Come on, <laughs> there's only one. I wish there was only one answer, but um, I would advise to test both. Um, you know, keep it keep it on um, you know next to your windowsill for a week or a couple of days, and then put it in the rafters and test that for a couple of days. 
because again, every deployment's different. Um, and what, what works for you might not work for me. Um, it might be complete, complete opposites, even though it's the same house, but in two different parts of the uh, country. Yeah, I think this is an important point to hit. There's actually a couple important points. Number one, when you're testing antennas, don't rely on discovery. Um, no. If you have like a Glamos walker, if you have a specific antenna or mapping device, sure, you can use that. But in general, don't rely on discovery. Uh, what you should be doing for an antenna test, it should last at least three days. If you're serious, it'll last seven days. And then you've got two seven-day periods to compare against each other. And you've got a pretty good chance of making an informed decision there. It's not a guarantee. As we all know, uh, the network goes kind of up and down. It's, it's bananas right now, which is mid-November 2021. Um, so you may not get the you know correct results even with a seven day test, but don't think that if you put it in a place for one day and hit the disco button that you're getting accurate results that you can rely on. Yes, and we've actually had a couple of uh, customers write in saying, "Well, discovery mode says this, but my witnesses say that." Um, you know, always go off of witnesses when you have when you have an explorer. Um, at least that's what I do. Um, yeah. Discovery discovery mode is a great tool. It's a great concept. It just it's a little flawed. Um, you know, they're doing their best to fix it, but it, it's, uh, it is what it is. Um, but yeah. don't take that as, you know, the solid truth of that's, you know, that's the law and that's, that's all that's going to happen. It'll end up being awesome right now. It's got some hiccups. Okay. So mm -hmm. we talked about um, getting the thing as high as you can. So if you're stuck indoors, get it high, test those locations. I think if it were me, and I don't think this actually has a ton of weight, but if it were me, I would always get it in the attic and get it as high as I can versus getting it in a window. That's just me kind of thinking about how radio waves work. Um, that's what I would do, but obviously test both of them. The other thing to think about with, I think Laura specifically, is it needs, and this is the non-technical way of explaining it, but it needs some room to breathe. So you don't want to put it in like a wooden box where all the walls are really close. If you can give that signal some kind of space to, to propagate out to kind of whatever, to do its radio thing um, without getting in the, into the weeds, then... I think it's going to be a little bit better. So if you're putting it in your attic, don't necessarily put it, you know, right up against the wall two inches away. You might want to put it in the middle of your attic so it can kind of see in every direction and, and have the best chance to get around any obstacles that might be there. Is that, does that sound reasonable, Ben? Or are you just like, no, that's radio cuckoo shit? No, no, it's not cuckoo shit at all. Um, actually, I tested that in my own OG hotspot on my attic. Uh, I first put it near a window and then moved it to the center of my attic and it, it performed better in the center of my attic. Um, so it's kind of, you know, trial, trial and error, um, but we'll, that, that worked best for me. Um, some other people, again, you know, it's, it's all down to testing. That's what people need to understand is it, it's not cookie cutter. Um, everybody wants it to be, I wish it was. I'd be out of a job if it was, but I wish it was easier. Um, but it's it, using, you know, being able to test and see, um, you know, getting data-driven results, that's, that's what you're after. So the only way to do that is to test. Yep, is you want what's going to work for you. So, one thing to think about there, and this is a, a little off topic. In fact, I'll, I'll probably do a, an interview with Slavin over at Glamo, uh, Glamos is you want like a specific testing device to test these things is that your hotspot is actually not that great of a device because it only beacons a couple times a day and sometimes doesn't beacon at all. And what you want is a, you want to be able to see what it's doing when it beacons, which is transmitting out information. And you also want to see what happens when it witnesses, which is receiving information. And on the Glamos for sure, and, and plenty of other devices, you can use mappers, you can use a lot of other devices that are not as expensive. Um, you have a lot more control over how often and when it beacons and, and the results you're getting out of that. So, you know, if, if you're doing this and you're serious about it, 350, 400 bucks, whatever that thing is on a testing device, that's just going to be the cost of entry. Um, I don't make the rules. So that's just what it is. So you can certainly spend more if you want, right, Ben? <laughs> yep, you, you sure can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys I think when I was out there, you had some like $30,000 box to test stuff. I was like, ah, oh, that's probably out of the budget that I'm willing to spend on this, but pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, if people wanted to know, sure, we're, we're full of answers, but uh, you, don't, you don't need a $30,000 box uh, to make sure your stuff's working right. No, no, they're sexy, but it's like you pick it up and you're like, dude, I can't even find the on button on this thing. <laughs> Never mind being able to use it. Okay, let's talk about, I think this kind of last thing I've got on my list is the different types of materials that Laura will go through. Um, I've seen mm -hmm. lots of talk about, oh, it, you know, sometimes it'll go, it'll go through single pane glass, but it won't go through triple pane, low E glass. It'll go through drywall, better that it goes through glass, you know, concrete stops it. Is there a sensible way to think about that? Or is it just, you have to test it every time? Uh, I mean, the easiest way to think about it uh, is the more dense something is, the more RF doesn't want to travel through it. 
Um, that's just an easy way to understand it. If you have you know, single pane versus triple pane, there's three panes versus one pane, or if you have a concrete CME wall versus a uh, 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 piece of plywood, a um, piece of plywood is gonna be less resistant than an entire concrete wall. Um, and also depending on thickness, if it's only, you know, let's say it is a concrete wall, but it's only a foot thick versus three foot, uh, it's gonna be very hard to penetrate through that three foot, three foot thick, say that fast, uh, wall. Um, but the good thing is, is lower wind in 900 megahertz is good at penetrating objects. And um, that's why way back when, when the protocol was um, engineered, it, they used 900 meg because it's very good at getting through things. And you don't have to have, you know, a clear line of sight um, and you don't have to have a lot of bandwidth, especially with, with helium. So it's, it's it's better at penetrating things. Yep. That's actually a great point because I make a huge deal of like, hey, you have to have clear line of sight, you have to have clear line of sight, et cetera, et cetera. But you technically don't have to have a clear line of sight. You just should if you want it to go as far as possible. So I've seen studies where LoRaWAN will, or Laura will penetrate through something like three or four buildings in an urban environment before it gets totally stopped. So it will go through stuff. It's not like um, a laser where you point it at a, a concrete wall and it just stops. Like it'll go through this stuff. But this is one of those things where we just say, okay, what's the best we can do? What are the best practices? And, and here they are. And then you just do the best you can within it. If you can get it on top of a mountain, on top of a radio tower, then do that. If you can't do that, and all you can do is inside your house, you know, in your bedroom, then that's what you're stuck with. But if you can, you just do the very best you can. So get it up on in the attic. If you can get it outside, get it outside. If you can't, get it as high as you can or test it against a, um, a window. And, and another, uh, actually, I'm thinking about this. Um, it's all about optimizing where you are, because even if you have a stock antenna and it's just sitting on your desk at home, it's still going to work. You, you can just make it work better. Um, a lot of people get hung up on, oh, I, I have to put 30 foot of coax of LMR 400 up there. It's going to, this thing isn't going to work at all. That's not the case. It'll just work less good. It's not that it's not going to work. Um, and if you have to run 30 foot of coax, you, that's what you have to do. Um, or if you want to spend more money and more time on it, you can go the POE route and get an outdoor enclosure and, and have your coax run go from 30 foot down to six inches, or just use a bulkhead and have it directly connected to the, uh, the miner. It's, it's really how much effort, how much money, um, how much time you want to spend getting the best, the best performing um, scenario for the hotspots. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's where, where you fall in that spectrum of, of uh, how crazy you want to get. Exactly. I like to think of it as a spectrum of excellence, but I think some people, probably my wife included, would be called a spectrum of crazy. Um, <laughs> okay. The last thing I think I want to hit is this idea, and we hit it a little bit before with the idea of the attic, but I'm seeing like suction cup mounts that are uh, right next to the window. Mm -hmm. If that was yours, would you prefer to put the antenna kind of two inches from the window in that suction cup mount, or would you mount the antenna a little further off from the window, maybe to more towards the center of the room? Let's say you couldn't test and you had to choose, which, which would you at least start with? Uh, I would probably start with putting it in the center of the room um, and not lose sleep over it and not worry about it. Uh, just let it run and, and see what happens. Um, again, going back to testing, if you let it run for three, four days, and you, you should get some results. And then if you move it closer, closer to the window, I mean, that's the only variable that you've changed. So moving it closer to the window, if it gets worse, move it back. Um, and there's no, and I wish I could say like, oh, you could you should have it, you know, two wavelengths away from the window and it'll be perfect. But it's, again, it's all about testing and figuring out what's, what's best for you. Yeah. Dig it. What about, I think I've gotten this question a couple of times. Can I put the antenna like upside down in my ceiling so that it's mm -hmm. away from everything? It's mounted in the ceiling, but it's just upside down. Is that something where you're like, absolutely do not do that? Or is that something where like, yeah, test it? Um, no, you can actually, you can do that because it's a omnidirectional antenna. It's going 360 degrees around. I mean, it does have a little null zone and exactly, you know, right above the antenna and right below it. So if you flip the way it's oriented, whether it be you know, like you said, inverted like this on a ceiling or upright like this, you're getting the same propagation characteristics. Um, you're just changing how you physically mount it. It's not going to, you're not going to get a 10% better performance having it upright than, than, than upside down. But do be wary if you're using a directional antenna or something that's not omnidirectional, you will probably make things a lot, a lot worse if you don't mount it how you're supposed to mount it. Sure. Dig it. I think that's most of the questions I get about kind of indoor versus outdoor. Is there anything else that, that you see pretty commonly when folks call you up? And it's funny, they, they 
I see on YouTube, they're like, yeah, I watched the video. I called up, I talked to Ben and I bought an antenna. So it's like, there's a, a nice direct connection here. It's like humans helping humans. It's not just all computer crap. Is there anything else that you, you hear a ton as a question? Um, I would say the, out of curiosity, uh, you know, like I said, when I show the elements, there are two different elements and really the main, the main factor of why we made the indoor versus the outdoors is form factor, is size. Um, and you can absolutely use the outdoor indoor and vice versa, the indoor outdoor. Uh, it's just, I highly recommend you weatherproof it. Um, I have seen our antennas completely full of water and they still work. They don't work that great, but it's, uh, even if a little bit of water gets in there, they'll still work. Oh, that's right. That's another question I get is, are they good in the cold? Someone is asking like, is, will that withstand like winter temperatures? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a passive antenna. There's no power except for the transmission that's being pushed through it. So uh, this thing can work uh, almost as cold as you want it to until the radome plastic can crack and fail. Um, and same thing with the heat, uh, putting it outside in the heat, it's not going to, it's not going to damage the antenna. Right. And is, is it Delrin is the stuff that it's the dome is made of? Uh, so we do, we do make, um, antennas with Delrin domes and those are extremely, uh, they're meant to be abused. Yeah. Um, these are just standard off the shelf plastics, but it's not, I mean, if I threw it against the wall, I'm going to crack it, but if you get a little scrape or something on it, or if, if it gets dropped from a ladder, it's, it shouldn't break. Okay, cool. Super cool. So it's fine temperature wise to go as, as hot or cold as, as it's reasonable to go. So whether you're in, you know, Arizona in the summer or Montana or, you know, uh, Michigan in the winter, shouldn't be an issue. Mm -hmm. No, no. Cool. Dig it. Anything else you want to add before we uh, wrap this sucker up? Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head, but if any, any questions come in, um, again, I, I promise I do answer emails and pick up the phone at MP. So if there's any questions, just go ahead and call. Hey folks, thanks a ton for watching that. I'm always excited to share information about the Helium Network. So what I've done is over the past year of doing consults and helping hundreds of people walk through their Helium hotspot deployments, whether that was one hotspot or 5,000 hotspots, I figured out a way to walk someone through understanding Helium in a fairly short amount of time. So in about an hour, I can walk you through the whole thing. We go from strategy to tactics, to gear list, to what things will impact you or affect you right now and what will affect you in the future. You can find that course over on the Gristle King website. So gristleking.com. Uh, usually up here in the top, I've got this online course here. Just hit that. It'll take you to the online course. And in that course, like I said, it's about a, an hour long video, a little bit less than an hour. And I'll walk you through soup to nuts what's going on. I update that video about once a month. It is paid access. So if you do want to kind of, instead of going through my whole site, everything is free on the site. If you want to condense everything into about an hour and not worry about searching through everything, this is what I've built for you. I um, hope it helps you a ton. Check out the Helium Basic course over on gristleking.com. And again, thanks a ton for watching. Rock on.